Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Pure Insights Teleconference on Tuesday, the 1st of November. Today's session is titled, How Will Innovation Growth in the East Impact on Western Companies? As you know, if you've been on one of these teleconferences before, we run them five times a year and invite uh, unique groups of industry leaders and thought leaders to share their varied experiences on innovation hot topics. These sessions are a powerful blend of good counsel drawn from multiple engagements and offer in-depth insights into specific company situations. Everybody hopefully knows who I am. My name's Mark Hillman. I'm head of our customer connectivity at Pure Insight and, of course, our web seminar program, which runs parallel to the uh, teleconference program. Uh, I've been with Pure Insight for about five years now. Uh, you can read a little bit about my biography there. Uh, I am an industrial designer by training, so I've been uh, operating in the innovation space for quite some time. And, uh, as I say, I've been at Pure Insight for five years. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Gunjan Bagla, who is Managing Director of AMRIP, Inc. Uh, he is joining us uh, at a very early time from the U.S. today, so we're very pleased that he's uh, joining us. Um, Gunjan, as I said, is Managing Director of AMRIP Ventures, which provides guidance in entering new markets, global strategy execution, uh, and finding and managing vendor partners and establishing offices overseas. His clients include many global corporations as well as emerging companies in North America and Europe. Mr. Bagler has got 25 years of global sourcing and marketing experience, and he has held senior positions in global technology sales and marketing, and has managed teams sourcing products and services from China, India, and Europe. He began his career as an engineer for Larson & Torbo, uh, a prominent Indian industrial firm, and later moved to the U.S., where he worked as director of program management for Tandem Computer. He is the author of Doing Business in the 21st Century India, How to Profit Today in Tomorrow's Most Exciting Market, and his articles on global business have been published in CIO Magazine, Business World, Daily Variety, and DataQuest India, to name but a few. He's a frequent speaker on this subject, and we're very pleased to have him join, this, uh, join us on this call today. Uh, unfortunately, our academic practitioner for this call uh, has been un unable to join the call at short notice, so uh, the call will be slightly shorter than uh, the normal calls, so we will run for about 45 minutes today. Uh, Gunjan has an excellent set of case studies that he'd like to present to you. Uh, questions are welcome at any time, as I'm sure he'll mention when he speaks himself, but we will be finishing approximately 15 minutes early. Okay, so with that in mind, I will pass over to you, Gunjan, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good afternoon to all of you who are joining this call. I am here at the uh, beautiful Biltmore Resort in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I am speaking at the PDMA Global Innovation Conference later this morning and it's a delight to join all of you uh, on today's uh, conversation. And I do mean this to be a conversation, so please uh, send me questions through the chat box at any moment. We are going to be talking about product development in emerging markets. And here's a little bit of background about Amrit. I won't spend much time on this slide since uh, Mark has already introduced me. Uh, I just want to mention uh, that this is my day job. I help VPs of engineering, chief technology officers, uh, to be able to engage more uh, effectively with emerging economies. And uh, at the bottom of the slide, I have uh, some references uh, to my articles, which I'm happy to share with you, including one that is appearing this month in PDMA Visions. So today we'll talk about an overview of emerging markets very briefly. We'll talk about innovation for emerging markets, and I'll give some, uh, some caveats around cross-cultural communication challenges. We'll look at a couple of uh, examples of innovation happening in that part of the world. And if we have time, I'll talk to you about some myths and common mistakes. And like I said, I'll take questions all through. So first, I want to clarify what I'm not talking about. Today's session is not, on how, uh, not, not a session on how to manage a globally distributed team or how to select your R&D partner in that part of the world. We could have a separate sessions on these subjects in the future, which I'm happy to do, but today it's really more about innovation for that market. And uh, we are assuming that the innovation spectrum may include some of your own people working in that part of the world. It could include people who are external to you, uh, and uh, they could be in any kind of relationship, whether it's a supplier, joint venture, doesn't really matter. So why, why are emerging markets important today to European 
American and Japanese companies? Why, why do they matter to the first world? Uh, here, here is one way to look at it, and this is a graph taken from data uh, projected by uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, they're looking at the economy as it might be in the year 2025. And you see that some countries uh, from the emerging world rank fairly highly here. I've got arrows pointing to China and India and Brazil in particular. Uh, and these countries are expected to rise pretty dramatically. So this means that you as innovators are, would be interested in selling into these markets and also uh, taking advantage of talent or intellectual property that might exist in these markets. So let's take a quick look at what's happening today uh, for these markets. I have some very diverse examples here. Uh, Nokia is, uh, might be under some pressure in the rest of the world, but continues to be very successful in India. And recently, they introduced a charger for their cell phone. And this is uh, a, ch a charger that you connect to your bicycle. And so that uh, your, your pedal power charges the cell phone. Now, this is not a green peacenik kind of thing in India. It's actually something that makes a tremendous amount of sense in many parts of the country where electric power is unreliable. And uh, you may not have power for your home, but you do want your cell phone to work at all times. And this is a great way to be able to charge it. A few months ago, the New York Times had an article on an unusual uh, online company called Igniter, based in New York City. And this is a website that enables people to go on dates, you know, for young people to go on a date as a group rather than just as a pair, so that a number of uh, friends might get together and uh, you know, four or six or eight of them may go together uh, for a group date. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, the uh, largest number of users that they have for this website comes from India. And the reason is that uh, conservative Indian parents are much happier if, if their sons and daughters are, uh, are going out on a date together and the, 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 the kids feel that they can share information about such dates with their family. Uh, the family bonds are very strong in India. And so somehow this has resonated very well with, uh, with the Indian population. And the New York Times article talked about how they are now developing a special website just for their Indian consumers. Let's talk about something entirely different. Let's look at a, a highly uh, business-oriented product. And I have a link that you can watch at your convenience. But Cisco, uh, one of the world's most successful companies, decided that they would locate some of their top executives out of Silicon Valley all the way to what they call Cisco East, based in Bangalore. And at Cisco East, where they have thousands of employees, they are designing new products for worldwide application. The first such product was released a couple of years ago, and this is the product that enables buildings to become smarter. It's a router for a building or intelligence for, uh, you know, that, that controls the air conditioning, the security, all of the controls that might, uh, uh, that might apply to a building. They chose to design this product entirely in Bangalore and then launch it first in India and then uh, across the globe. Uh, this is not something that might even have been anticipated a few months ago, a few years ago. There was an interview with the, uh, chief, te with the chief technology officer of Yahoo India where he disclosed that uh, almost a third of the IP developed by this uh, company is developed in India. So this, is, this phenomenon is happening across multiple dimensions. As some of you think about emerging markets, these are the types of questions that you might want to consider. You know, should I localize my product design for India, for China, for Brazil, for Latin America, for, for Africa? And if I do localize the product, where should that localization be performed and who should do it? Should I introduce a product for a market such as China or India that takes away some key features and uh, uh, thereby offers a lower price point? Is that, is that a desirable approach or not? And if I do that, is there a risk that my Western sales, European, uh, American sales might get compromised by some of this product making its way back to the developed markets? These are all valid questions. 
Uh, and uh, there are no simple answers and no singular answers to these. It really depends on your situation. And uh, uh, so this, these are things that my colleagues and I spend many hours, weeks, and months discussing with our clients to come up with an answer that's appropriate for them. I'm going to talk about some general factors that affect our thinking that are drawn from dozens of, uh, of uh, individual experiences that we have gathered over the last decade. So how do you go about innovating for emerging markets? You might argue that there are some products that are suited for centralized design where you don't want to use a distributed development team. And that's fine. Things such as nuclear power plants and aircraft come to mind, although in both of those cases, sometimes political factors or counter-trade uh, offset reasons that dictate some portion of the design or production being done outside the home country. I'm sure many of you are aware of how uh, Airbus uh, does that kind of work when they, when they sell into a country such as China or India. And here in the US, uh, Boeing does the same kind of thing. But we won't dwell on the, those political factors for now. It's clear that many products need to be modified to meet local needs when you are selling to a market such as China, India, Brazil, or any emerging country. Some of these are dictated by local physical conditions uh, India, for example, has a lot higher humidity, and there's a lot more ambient dust in the urban environments. The uh, utility power is not very stable. You may, you may design your product for 50 cycles and find that you might get 48 cycles one day and 54 the next. Uh, it may be 220 volts today and 180 or 240 the next day, and so your product has to be able to withstand those types of uh, extremes and still survive. In my book on doing business in India, I talked about uh, how Johnson & Johnson, when they introduced uh, the Band-Aid product in India uh, several decades ago, found that not only did they have to localize for materials that they could buy in a country such as India, they had to localize because Indian skin characteristics are different, and uh, the ambient humidity is different, and so the adhesive had to be changed. There's a great case study about uh, PepsiCo's uh, Tropicana fresh juice, and when they launched in India, they found a real challenge uh, because Indians don't like to drink sour liquids at breakfast, and in the U.S., typically their market was orange juice for breakfast, so they had to reposition re, uh, their product. They had to reorient their messages to be successful. Sometimes it's not the physical design of the product. It's the usage model that you need to change the whole business model in, in which the consumer or the business user gets to experience the product. So uh, there are examples such as uh, uh, diesel gensets, which instead of being sold to the uh, end user in a country such as India or, or Brazil, uh, are being offered on a per hour basis. Where you only pay for what you use. And the, of course, the effective cost per hour is much higher but it works out for the uh, renter to be able to get just what they need. Uh, there are, uh, we could go on and on discussing uh, you know, some of the reasons why you want to innovate for the, uh, for the emerging market. Uh, price is often a concern, and it's not always that you need to defeature and lower the price point. Sometimes you need to offer a whole spectrum of price points because the nature of usage in an emerging market may be very different than, than it might be in your home markets. So you may have a very low-cost product, you may have a very high-end product which bundles service and other features, uh, uh, benefits that, that you don't offer at the low end. That's not uncommon uh, when you look at uh, emerging market success. Uh, often this is done in a phased manner where you introduce uh, one or two flavors of the product, and then as you establish success, you move on from that and continue to, uh, to add uh, uh, SKUs, uh, features, models, uh, depending on your, uh, your product line and your, the nature of your business. Many VPs of engineering, directors of, uh, uh, directors of uh, uh, R&D uh, face the question of, well, how do I retain my good talent in an economy such as China, which is growing at about 10%, or India, which is growing at about 8%. Uh, in the West, my salaries are 
perhaps increasing at 2 or 3%. I don't really have a retention problem. But when I go to a country such as uh, China or India, I visit Shanghai or Bangalore, uh, the environment there is very different. And yes, the compensation is an important factor in these markets, but there are several other factors that are important, particularly for young engineers and scientists in their 20s or early 30s. You must show them a commitment to develop their skills. They must feel on a year-to-year -year basis that they are growing, that they are being able to improve their capabilities. If they don't get that, they will make a change. And you might lose someone, not just on financial uh, accounts, but really that they feel that, that they, they don't have as good a career prospect within your organization, or sometimes even your supplier's organization. We've, we've been involved in these discussions where we advise our clients to work with their outsourced R&D providers in a, in, a, in a very tight manner to ensure that the most valuable contributors on the supplier side also see this kind of development. Mentoring and coaching is important in any part of the, uh, of the world, but it becomes particularly important in a dynamic, fast-changing economy such as China or India. Uh, people want to feel that connectivity with their boss. The boss is almost part of the family in many cases, particularly in India. So you want to have that very tight relationship of mentoring uh, by, by the boss and maybe by the boss's boss. The employee must see a clear, clear career path, at least for the next couple of years, and should have some rough idea of where they might end up a decade from, from any point in time. These are important factors to consider when you look at, uh, when you look at hiring and retaining talent in any emerging economy. When you deal with people from the Asian economies in particular, you'll find that cross-cultural communication can be a significant asset or a significant barrier depending on your, uh, your particular position. Uh, we, we've all heard that yes does not necessarily mean yes when you're speaking to somebody from India, China, Japan, any, 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 uh, any of those Asian countries. And it's important to understand that you should not make a judgment call. You, there, there shouldn't be a value judgment. When, someone, when you ask a question and someone says yes, uh, it is really up to the Western listener or the Western communicator to be able to understand what that yes means. Sometimes the yes simply means, I heard you. Sometimes it simply means, please go on. Uh, I, I understand this point. Let's move on to the next one. Often in the West, we take that yes to mean, yes, I agree with what you have said, and I will do what you asked for, and it will be done on time and under budget. None of that is implied necessarily in, in somebody saying yes or nodding. Uh, the intent of the individual needs to be verified uh, much more vigorously than when you are talking to someone within your own culture. Now, to some extent, these variations exist even within Europe, a Northern European interacting with a Southern European may find that there's a, there's a vast gap in the way that communication happens. Well, you take that gap and you expand it uh, by an order of magnitude, and that's what you have when you are dealing with uh, someone from Europe or America interacting with uh, someone from China or India. I had the opportunity to make a presentation to one of Denmark's largest companies, and it was a two-day seminar, and we spent a good deal of time on this very subject. Uh, because this was a source of endless frustration to many of the top Danish managers uh, at this company. Um, in, the, in, in the East, people are trained to be indirect. They don't, you know, in, in, in America we have a saying, let's call a spade a spade. And uh, in a country such as India, it's very rare that someone will call a spade a spade. It's almost considered impolite to be able to, 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 to do so, particularly in any kind of interpersonal situation. So you have to be able to ferret out the truth and the intent by going beyond the direct questions. It's further complicated by the fact that when you have a reporting relationship in, in a country such as India, uh, which has over the last many centuries been subject to colonial domination, as, as, as to some extent were uh, you know, parts of, the other, uh, of, of other, other emerging economies, that there's a tendency to just defer to the person in power. Uh, and not challenge them, even when the individual knows that they are plainly wrong. And 
as a Western manager, you need to be able to get over that and be able to empower your Eastern participants, whether they work for you or they are your suppliers, to be able to disagree with you, to be rewarded for disagreeing with you, to, to be encouraged to disagree with you. And then you will get the good news as well as the bad news when you need it. I could go on and on on, on this slide, but uh, uh, out of respect for time, I'm going to move on. So there's a question from, uh, from one of our uh, listeners. Uh, they're asking, as you reference a Western perspective of, on innovating with India and other economies, uh, it seems to push Western thinking into that market as they have the historical expertise. At what point do you think economy, growing economies will start to lead the West in key NPD decisions, i.e. that they are the dominant partner or market? That's a great question. Uh, I think it will be some time before you see leadership across the board coming from the emerging economies. But certainly, there are many examples where countries, where companies in China and India, when they are serving their own markets, are starting to exhibit very leading edge thinking that sometimes puts them way ahead of the multinationals who are operating in the same market. Um, you will start to see, I think, over the next five years, a few examples where companies from China, India, Brazil will cross the divide and start to offer innovative products worldwide. In a sense, you might say Embraer out of Brazil is already doing that in, in the aircraft market. Uh, they have some very strong uh, positions for certain segments of the aircraft market. I think you'll start to see more of that from India and, and China as well. I've got some examples later on that will address part of this. Uh, let's talk about some case studies here. So in, in countries such as India, water is a major problem. And most people don't trust the water offered by their municipal utility. So for, for the last couple of decades, anybody in the upper middle class in India typically has an in-home uh, water purifier. Very often, it's an RO system. Now, these are expensive. They require regular maintenance. And so they are really only suitable for people who can afford them. A few years ago, uh, Unilever, which is India's largest consumer product company, uh, introduced a product called Pureit. And the idea of Pureit was that uh, you, could, you could get clean water for a much lower cost. But it, is, it does require electricity to run. The product was a huge success. More recently than that, an Indian company introduced the product featured here called the Swatch, which means clean in Hindi. And this came out of Tata Chemicals, which is the world's second largest producer of soda ash. They decided that they wanted to innovate and get into new markets. They hired some of the top nanotechnologists in the world and went about designing a really low-cost uh, uh, system to purify water. This requires no electricity, no batteries, no running water connection. You just fill the portion at the, the compartment in the top. Water flows through, driven by gravity, through this filter that, uh, that uses primarily rice husk. And uh, at the end, you get, you get water that is, uh, that is uh, drinkable, pretty clean. And it's, it's the world's uh, lowest cost uh, water purifier sold uh, by a commercial entity. I've got a close-up view of the of the filter, there's, uh, there's over a dozen patents they filed uh, uh, for this product. They have obtained certifications for germ kill not only from, uh, from Indian authorities, they, fo they thought it would help them make their case by getting four certifications out of European entities. The current market is India only, but once they have built up the scale, I have every expectation that they will offer this in Latin America, Africa, and other, other markets. Let's talk about another market, uh, another product category, uh, refrigerators, uh, appliances. And this is, uh, this is a category in India where there are strong domestic players that have done very well. And it's a market where you would typically expect the Chinese and Korean companies to be strong, companies such as Hire out of Ch China and Samsung. Uh, they are certainly present, and they do well. Uh, some years ago, General Electric, who, we, who sells about $3 billion of other products into the Indian market, 
determined that they could not really play in the appliance market and withdrew. Whirlpool USA, however, took a different path and they stuck it out. They sell dishwashers, they sell uh, uh, clothes washers. Uh, here I've got an example of their proton refrigerator. They recognize the needs of large Indian families. The typical Indian family has three generations living under the same roof, the grandparents, the parents, and the children. And uh, it is not unusual in India to have joint families where two brothers are, and their, their, uh, their wives and kids are staying in the same household. So designing a large refrigerator made sense. Uh, much of Indian cooking is uh, very aromatic, and so they wanted to provide a method that you could uh, seal off some of the cooked food that you put back in the fridge to be able to prevent the odor from migrating to, to uh, the freezer section or the, the bottom tray. And these, uh, these types of features have led Whirlpool to become the market leader in India in many of the categories where it plays. Uh, they've done very well in the, in the clothes washing market as well. Uh, they manufacture most of their product right in India, and they are selling not only into the Indian market, but they are exporting from India to other countries as well. Here's another example, and I've talked about this in my Business Week article that was referenced earlier. So I won't dwell on this very much. The GE Mac 400 is a low-cost ultrasound machine designed for uh, rural application, sold primarily in India right now, but uh, also expanding into Brazil and other markets. Uh, there was a very interesting article about Siemens where they, they used their engineering team in Goa to uh, design uh, a, a, a camera for a very high-end scanner where they were able to use low-cost chips that, that I, of the kind that are used in, uh, in, in surveillance cameras that cost just a few dollars as opposed to a few hundred dollars. And this mode of frugal innovation is something that I think you will start to see play out uh, more and more. Uh, the question that the, the questioner asked earlier about innovation coming out of countries such as India and applying to the rest of the world, this is happening primarily under the umbrella of Western companies operating in India today or in China today. And that's the example that I'm, I'm highlighting on this slide where it's Siemens selling a, a high-end scanner into Europe and America using engineering talent from India for innovation. Is GE designing an ultrasound machine from scratch at that center, at the Jack Welch Center in Bangalore and selling it, uh, selling it primarily in India for now but eventually overseas? Okay, very timely, there's a question from Michael about how to protect confidential documentation manuals from being copied in distributors to competitors and counterfeiters in developing markets. I think that's a very important question. Uh, and the short answer is that you apply the same kinds of protections that you would anywhere in the world. The extra care that you have to take is that sometimes the law will not work as vigorously for you in a country such as uh, China or India. Uh, now, I should differentiate between those two countries a little bit here uh, because our client experience certainly has been different. India was a founding member of the World Trade Organization, and as, as it joined the WTO, it made a commitment to modify all of its IP laws to meet the trade-related aspects of uh, intellectual property, or TRIPS, as it is uh, commonly called. And uh, about five years ago, they completed all of their compliance with TRIPS. So there is no, for the most part, there is no institutional theft of IP happening in a country such as India. So Indian companies have to run clean operations. The Indian government runs the clean operation. Sure, at the retail level, uh, with software and with uh, digital products such as movies, there is, uh, there, there is definitely the theft of, uh, of, of IP where people are pirating product and selling it on the street. But I live here in Los Angeles, and in, down, uh, in downtown Los Angeles, you can see people doing the same thing with movies out of Hollywood. So this is by no means a phenomenon restricted to the emerging uh, world. The aspect of confidentiality, I think, is very important. And we have to recognize that it's, you certainly want to place the legal agreements uh, that protect you. But those alone are not sufficient. Many times a company 
a partner in India, an employee in India or China, is not used to all the fine language about uh, intellectual property, confidentiality, and trade secrets. So you must, in addition to getting people to sign these agreements, you must make sure that they understand them and they know in a very practical sense what they must do and not do. So when is it appropriate to take material home to read? Can you copy anything to your personal laptop if you want to get ahead and, and perform, uh, perform something faster? When is it appropriate to go to an open source kind of format to borrow code and use it? And why should you not share your own company's code in one of those formats? Each of these things has to be discussed in a very real sense and explained to your business partners in that part of the world, to the employees in that part of the world. They must understand what is right and what is wrong. For the most part, I would say that if you look at the larger participants in a country such as India, there have been very few violations of confidentiality. Uh, in fact, as I look at the, the leakage that has happened in, here in the United States where 40 million social security numbers were disclosed on, 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 on one stolen laptop and other instances where, uh, where credit card information has been disclosed very widely, there are far fewer cases of that happening uh, in India where millions of people today are working in the call center business, in the uh, knowledge service business where they have access to crucial information that could be very damaging to the clients if used in inappropriately. So it is something that you need to worry about, you need to be careful about, but it's not, protect, it's not going to be protected by agreements alone. You need to exercise the due diligence. We tell our clients, and sometimes we, you know, our, our own people run these training sessions in both countries to educate people as to how to go about dealing with this. You have to train the Western side as well as the Asian side so that people understand how this functions. There's another question about how should a company currently op operating mainly in the West see the Indian market? As a single area or a collection of territories where different approaches is requir are required? That's an excellent question and one that I have not addressed in this particular presentation, so I'm glad you're asking this, uh, Ralph. For many product categories, India is as diverse as all of Europe. So if you are selling to Indian consumers, people in the north, in the state of Punjab, are very different than people in the west, in the state of Gujarat, or people in the south, say in the state of Kerala, or people in the other part of the Indian south, in the state of Tamil Nadu, they are right next to each other, but the people may be as different as, as the French are from the Germans in many ways. And so for many, many product categories, we recommend to our clients that they look at launching in India step by step. And sometimes the market will surprise you. We have a, a client who, uh, who uh, wanted to launch their product in North India because that's where their product category was sold but most of their competition was not from American suppliers. It was from a product imported from another country much nearer to India. We discovered that the American product resonated far more in the South than it did in the North, so their initial market presence was far more successful in the cities of Bangalore and, and Hyderabad and Chennai than in Delhi and, 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 the, and the North, and for the first three years they built their market primarily in the South. So you, can, you can't always go in with a preconceived notion that something that has worked traditionally is going to work for me as a new entrant. But you do typically need to treat India as a segmented market. This is true in the case of business or industrial products as well, although the reasons for segmentation there may vary, and there may be a little less geographical variation. There may be more market uh, industry variation or... Uh, you know, some other types of factors that play into, into the segmentation. But yeah, it's very seldom that you can introduce the same product all across the country and, and it sells uh, uniformly. We are coming close to the end of, our, end of my time, so I will not dwell very, very much on this particular slide. 
talking about some myths and oversimplifications that could hurt you. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions on this by email later on if someone wants me to clarify some of these points. So the takeaway is really from today's presentation. Number one is that the emerging markets are huge and growing. Number two, that both your product features and the business models may need to be different. Number three, that when you look at retaining engineers and scientists in that part of the world, whether it is people who are working for your own company or people who are uh, uh, at your suppliers, you must approach the re talent retention and, uh, and the talent attraction question very differently. If you ignore these basic truths, you are going to suffer one way or the other. Your company is going to suffer. And more importantly, I think for each of us, we should recognize that this is also a question of personal career success. We find uniformly that those managers and executives at our client companies that embrace globalization are rising faster in their companies than those who do not. So this is, this is a huge tidal wave that is moving in a certain direction. If you participate in it, you, are go, you, you will go ahead, get ahead and your company will get ahead. If you don't, you're going to find that, uh, that there, will be, uh, there will be consequences both for your company as well as for yourself. Yeah, so the idea about pushing Western thinking into emerging markets, I, let, me, let me dwell for a, another minute or so on that. I think historically that is exactly what worked. And certainly until 10 years ago, the common way for Western companies to succeed in emerging markets was to take yesterday's successes, the old cash cows, and, and then offer them into the emerging markets. And, and be able to extend the product life cycle, as they used to say. Well, that approach seldom works anymore. And uh, certainly for those who want to be market leaders, that approach is not sufficient. I'm happy to take additional questions. Broadly speaking, I think they are very keenly interested in, in open innovation. Uh, historically, the flow of technology and IP licensing has been in one direction where a company in China or India might say, I want to license this type of engine or that type of filter technology and apply it into the Indian market or the Chinese market. And now they're seeing that, uh, that it is really a two-way flow. In fact, in, in 45 minutes here in, uh, in Phoenix, I'm going to be presenting a case study where we took uh, Clorox to India and uh, found them a partner where they could develop product with a, with a key Indian partner and, uh, and then market it worldwide. So uh, that kind of thing is happening very vigorously uh, at, uh, at consumer product companies, at industrial companies. Uh, collaborators in, in a country like India or China might be corporations. They might be for higher service companies, or in some cases they are universities and uh, government labs. We see it across the spectrum of open innovation. OK, uh, we have another question. What one piece of advice would you give when entering the Indian market? Now, that's a tough one. I'd say if I look back at the last 10 years of doing this, I'd, what I say might, might surprise you a little bit. Approach that market with humility. And I say this uh, very, very uh, carefully and humbly myself. People often call me an India expert, and they think that I have all the answers. I can tell you that I don't. On, main, on virtually every trip that I take to India, and often I'm traveling with my clients, I come away with at least one or two key insights that I say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that this was true. And all these years, I've been saying quite the opposite, or I've not been addressing this particular point. It's a complex country. It's changing fast. It, it makes people uh, uh, very humble by failing in the market. If you're humble when you go in, you're, you're likely to succeed uh, much more readily. Uh, you have to be open. You have to be able to listen. 
to what the market is telling you, and that's much harder to do than it is for me to say. I could probably spend a whole hour talking about that very subject. Uh, there are many, many examples of how people have not listened to the Indian market or listened to something that someone was saying and ended up making the wrong decision. One example I'll give is so many companies today want to go and locate in Bangalore, and I think for 90% of those companies, it's absolutely the wrong choice. I love Bangalore. I lived there, and I, you know, I, I would love to go back and settle there at one, one point, but for most Western companies today, Bangalore is much too competitive because so, so many other people are already there. And in the last five years, we've taken our clients to many, many different uh, uh, cities in India, very different markets than Bangalore. So, yeah, be humble, be ready to listen. Uh, Kushan, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. I realize that we're just uh, very, very close to time now. So um, from my perspective and Pure Insights perspective, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us uh, so early in the morning for you uh, over there in the States. Um, thank you to everybody who's been on the call. Thank you for the questions. I think there's been some excellent questions there. Um, if anybody who's on the call would still like to ask further questions, um, you can see that I've uh, gone back to the slide there with uh, Gunjan's email address on there. Please feel free to contact him directly uh, or, of course, uh, email myself, which is mark.ilman at pure-insight.com, uh, and we'll make sure that those get through to Gunjan. Uh, for now, thank you again for attending today's session. I'll just quickly notify everybody of the next teleconference that we've got. That's in December, on Tuesday, the 7th of December. Uh, that's going to be looking at safe uh, innovation with suppliers and the strategies that you can employ for that. Thanks very much, everybody. This session is now closed.